Well, thank you guys so much. Please, please, sit, sit, sit. Oh, my fucking goodness. Look at this. New York City. We are here, thank God. I've been traveling. I was just in Texas, and I got my first taste of Southern hospitality on the plane, because there was a baby crying. And some lady yelled out, if you don't shut that baby up and feed it, I'll take my titty out and feed it myself. <laughs> so then I started crying. <laughs> wah, 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 bitch, I'm a baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you guys so much for being here. I've been all around this country because of this amazing technology known as TikTok. <laughs> Clap if you're here from TikTok. TikTok has given all of you ADD and turned it into money for me. And all I can say is thank you, China. I love China. China is the greatest country in the world. Matter of fact, I learned some Mandarin from my Chinese overlords. It goes, Hong Kong, she woman duh, which translates to Hong Kong belongs to China. I love China. <laughs> Speaking of China, any Asians here? Okay. I like how most of the Indians stay quiet. Good job, guys. <laughs> that was a test. <laughs> That's right, I'm not going to start rapping Asians now. Indians and Asians have a beef since calculus class. <laughs> I'm going to shit on Asians, okay? I got Asian friends with strong Asian names like John and Victor. They're good guys. <laughs> this whole Stop Asian Hate movement, nah, I don't know how I feel about it. Don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I don't condone the violence. I actually went to a Stop Asian Hate march. At least I thought I did. Turns out I was just online at Supreme. And <laughs> struggle is real. But the whole Asian Hate movement is emblematic of a much larger problem in this country. See, in this country, we never treat the disease. We only treat the symptom. See, we don't need to stop Asian hate. We need to stop American stupidity. That's what needs to happen. Stop, don't clap. People started beating up Asians because some asshole got on TV and said Asians have a highly contagious virus. Someone tells you Asians have a highly contagious disease and your first instinct is to get within fighting distance of this person? <laughs> What's that? You got AIDS? Well, let me fuck you in the ass just to show you what happens. <laughs> what are we doing? I knew at a very early age not to fuck with Asian people. My best friend in high school was this Chinese kid. He was so Chinese, he was valedictorian. And he was also a swimmer, 100% all muscle. You'd have to have brain damage to fuck with him, so naturally, a hockey player did. And <laughs> One day I saw him shoulder check this ice jockey into a concrete wall. And I was like, bro, why the hell did you just do that? He's like, he called me the worst thing you could call a Chinese person. Japanese. Like, oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> it's been humbling to travel this country and, and realize I have fans. It's made me think of who my first fans were. And it had to be my grandparents. My grandma was the first person to ever laugh in my face on purpose. I was four years old. She's like, you look like Mr. Bean. <laughs> I thought it was a compliment. I was like, mm -hmm. I know you see it. It's fine. <laughs> I've come to terms with it. To those of you that don't find Mr. Bean attractive, I assure you, Mr. Bean fucks. <laughs> All day, every day. You want it, you can get it. I got you. <laughs> Mr. Bean fucks. I'm going to put that on a t-shirt for sure. <laughs> Just. <laughs> my grandparents are the reason I'm funny. I remember the first joke I ever told was to my grandpa. Uh, I was five years old, and to avoid an ass whooping, I used a joke. He was towering over me. He said something in Gujarati. He said, Tarumatu tarakan vachimukides, which translates to, I'll put your head between your ears. And I'm down there like, <laughs> it's already there, bro. <laughs> He started laughing. I was like, oh, shit. And I ran to my grandma's arms. She said, come in, Mr. Bean. And from that point on, I knew comedy could be used to avoid painful situations. 
I try to laugh at everything. <laughs> Laughing at death. You ever think about death? All the time. All the time. What's your name? John. All the time. You know how you want to go? A raging inferno. In a raging yes. inferno. Yeah, like, why not? Said, What's wrong with you? <laughs> You ever start a conversation with someone? Be like, man, I should not have done that. <laughs> <laughs> like you ask your Uber driver how the day is going, and then they respond, you're like, oh, my bad, bro, I didn't. <laughs> I was just raised well. <laughs> you know how I want to go? I want to die a burden to my family. That's how. <laughs> I want to go like 10 years after I'm supposed to. I'm going to leave a bunch of competing wills and some confusing documents. Like a do not resuscitate and then resuscitate using oral sex only. All kind of wild shit. <laughs> if you got to die, you might as well be annoying, you know? I've been thinking about death a lot because I got a city bike. And <laughs> if you've never questioned your own mortality, get a city bike. Just the other day, I was cruising, listening to Drake, and, and I almost got T-boned by a Volvo. That would have been a hilarious headline, though. Comedian killed by one of the safest cars in the world, God's plan. <laughs> death. Been thinking about death a lot. It's the only thing we all have in common. We're all gonna die. We're all gonna die. <laughs> that was my friend Kevin Barnett's catchphrase. We're all gonna die. He was a Jamaican man from Florida. And whenever he was bombing, he said, we all gonna die. He would bomb so hard, he had to remind people of the futility of human existence. <laughs> We're all gonna die. And then, you guessed it, he died. <laughs> this is the funniest joke he ever told. <laughs> it should win a Mark Twain prize. That's how funny that shit is. Because Mark Twain also famously predicted his own death and loved using the N-word as much as a Jamaican man from Florida. Don't cough again. <laughs> Can't be coughing now. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> What's wrong with you? This whole shit's about to get shut down. This is a very expensive production. <coughs> In the front row. Who the fuck? <laughs> Gee, I know why you've been thinking about death. <laughs> Killing everyone around you. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I almost died recently. I almost died last year, John. Hell, I'll tell you. You ever died? <laughs> You've never died. You ever been blackout drunk? Oh. <laughs> Congratulations. You've died. <laughs> Blacking out is when you die, John. Blacking out is when you die and you wake up in a new space-time continuum, and you've been afforded a brand new opportunity to live your life in an entirely different way, and yet 24 hours later, you're like, shot, 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 shot! <laughs> I died last year during the summer of hard seltzer. <laughs> True Lee's High Noons, and of course, White Claw. <laughs> One night, I had 20 mango White Claw. That's not an exaggeration. Over five hours, I had 20 mango white claw. After seven, they're just water, you know? And I got blackout drunk, and I hopped on a city bike in Chinatown, New York. Yeah, you know Chinatown, that place full of really good drivers and pedestrians that always look both ways, Chinatown? <laughs> blackout drunk in Chinatown, and I know I died because I saw my life flash before my eyes when I saw all the chickens I'd ever consumed hanging in a restaurant window. <laughs> blackout drunk. Rode four miles, no shirt, no helmet, no recollection. Get home to my wife, and she's heated. She's like, what the fuck? How the fuck did you get home? You could have died. I said the coldest shit I've ever said. I said, it ain't living if you ain't dying. <laughs> What's that mean? I don't know. I hope to find out someday. <laughs> Passed out on the punishment couch, obviously. <laughs> Woke up the next morning, and I had to reevaluate my relationship with alcohol. I took a long, hard look in the mirror and said, you know what? It's time to quit biking. Great decision. 
I'll never leave you, Mango. <laughs> You're my one and only. You ever thought about your relationship with alcohol? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you have. That's what you have, by the way. You have a relationship with alcohol. Anything you bring to your lips that often, you're at least hanging and banging. You understand? <laughs> Americans, we have a very abusive relationship with alcohol. We drank more in the last two years than we've ever drank in the history of this country. You know that? We drank more in the last two years than we've ever drank in the history of this country. Americans looked death in the face and said, cheers. <laughs> and I know this firsthand, because my dad has a liquor store. Cash only, obviously. And <laughs> I would talk to my dad every day. Dad, stop going to work. You're not essential. I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want you to get sick. You're a smoker. Stop going to work. He'd be like, no, Nimesh, these people need to drink. <laughs> and I didn't get it. I didn't understand why. I didn't understand why we were drinking so much until my wife and I both got coronavirus. We were locked up in the house for two weeks. At the end of those two weeks, I called my dad. I said, Dad, you're preventing murder-suicide every day. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for your service. Every day at 7 o'clock, I clap for my dad. I'm like, yeah, you the real hero, man. <laughs> Fuck these doctors. I've been thinking about my relationship to alcohol. I owe most of my life to alcohol. My love of hip-hop, for one, is from alcohol, because my dad's store was in a black neighborhood. He'd come home with the wildest CDs. The first album I ever listened to was hip-hop's hardest hits. It was Dead Wrong by Biggie, Hit Him Up by Tupac, and the Rough Riders anthem by DMX. And yo, I heard, and, 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 and. I was like, yo, I need Timberland boots immediately. <laughs> My eighth grade picture is me in tan Tims, a silver Rough Riders chain, and green contacts. <laughs> I had no idea who I was, but when that chain oxidized, it really brought out my eyes. It was beautiful. <laughs> Indians have a very interesting relationship with alcohol. And I don't mean Native Americans, I mean my people. <laughs> Any Natives here? Any Natives here? Wow. <laughs> what have we done? <laughs> I've only met one Native American my whole life. It was in the whitest place I've ever been. Denver, Colorado. <laughs> and he had the most Indian name I ever heard, Larry Bearshield. <laughs> and I was out after a show, and I see another brown person. I was like, hey, man, uh, just checking in, just in case some shit goes down. I got your back, you got mine, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was like, are you Latino or something? He goes, nah, man, I'm First Nation. I was like, is that some kind of Mexican gang or? <laughs> Nah, I'm, I'm Native American. I was like, oh, you're Indian? Me too. Let's have a drink. He did not like that. <laughs> Cut to two hours later, me and Larry are fucked up. And Larry is hilarious. I was like, Larry, what are you doing here in Denver? And he leaned in real close. He's like, man, I'm, I'm visiting my friends as part of Bill Cosby's favorite tribe, Arapaho. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Larry. <laughs> now, me and Larry are best friends, okay? Larry and I start playing this drinking game called Take Shots and Be Racist. I don't know if you've ever played it before, but if you're not being racist while drunk with your friends, you're wasting both friendship and alcohol. <laughs> and Larry starts going off the rails almost immediately. He's like, us Indians, we got a lot in common, right? Like, you love all that corny-ass jewelry. You guys can't handle your liquor. Us natives, we're real spiritual, but you guys, you guys worship monkeys. I was like, Larry, that's some hacky-ass racism. You better watch your mouth before I build a pipeline through it. We're friends. And now Larry's tomahawk chopping me. I'm yoga flaming him. We're having a great goddamn time. At one point, we're getting so loud, the bartender pours two drinks, and he tries to cut us off, takes him back, and Larry turns to him. He's like, listen, man, you can't Indian give to some Indians. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, Larry, you tell that cracker. Now Larry and I are, are trashed, OK? And I finally ask him, Larry, why does this stereotype exist? that Native Americans drink so much. And he gets up all angry and shit. He's like, we drink a lot because the colonizer robbed us and raped us and left us with this fire water to deal with our generational trauma. And he's all humping around and jumping around. I was like, Larry, relax. It's gonna start raining. <laughs> and he gives me a big old bear hug. He's like, you piece of shit. <laughs> and he sits down 
and, and he reaches into his satchel. <laughs> and he pulls out this turquoise medallion, this beautiful turquoise medallion, and he hands it to me as a prize for being the best racist. <laughs> he, says, he says, Nimesh, I want you to have this. May it bring you good fortune and protect you from evil spirits like tequila. <laughs> I couldn't help resist saying, thank you, Larry. I'll wear it to the casino. And, <laughs> and then I run to the bathroom, take a piss, and pack a peace pipe. And when I come back, Larry is gone, like a wolf in the night. <laughs> and then I get the check. <laughs> and I realize Larry has manifest destined me out of $300, this piece of shit. <laughs> That's reparations, I'll take it, it's fine. <laughs> well, I wish he stayed, though. I wish Larry stayed at the bar, because then I would have told him that Indians like me also drink because we also got robbed, specifically at liquor stores at gunpoint. <laughs> That's what my dad drinks. My dad would drink because he's been robbed. He's been shot at for like 400 bucks. That's why I drink, because kids emulate behavior. When I was 13, I saw my dad come home after having a tough day, go to the garage with his white friend, Johnny Walker Black, and <laughs> pour himself a little whiskey, be like, I can't believe it. I almost died. I drowned that demon, you know? When I was 13, I had a tough day. I had done poorly on a math test. <laughs> Went to the garage, poured myself a little Johnny Walker Black. Can't believe it. I got a 97. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what do you think happens after we die? Blackness? Blackness, nothing. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know what your accent is, but... New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my accent from? This is what I think, this is what I think happens when you die, okay? I think your body dissolves, but your souls are born into different vessels, go through this iterative process perfecting your souls until you reach perfection, and then you're released into the universe from whence we came. That's what I think happens. Yeah. Yeah, I stopped drinking as much, but I started doing a lot more LSD, and let me tell you, it's been fantastic. <laughs> I highly recommend it. It's a great drug. That is a Hindu belief. Any religious people here, by the way? None? Oh, okay. Everyone else? Just a bunch of little Nas X's, huh? <laughs> Everyone's just twerking on Satan. <laughs> are, you, are you all rich? <laughs> yeah. You never meet poor atheists. <laughs> oh, nah, we don't need God. We got cash, bruh. <laughs> Who do you blame for your problems? Yourselves? <laughs> no wonder y'all been drinking so much. <laughs> Some of my favorite people were religious. Kobe Bryant. Religious. He was at church the morning he died. Granted, he had a lot to repent for, but he was trying. <laughs> oh, you're not laughing. <laughs> soft. <laughs> you guys are softer than Joe Biden's diapers. Soft, <laughs> soft as shit. <laughs> I subscribe to Kobe Bryant's Mamba mentality. The Mamba mentality, if you're unaware, says perfect yourself every day get better every day until you reach perfection. That's the central tenet of Hinduism. Y'all say Mamba, I say Gita, huh? <laughs> wow. Bunch of Kwame Browns in this bitch, huh? <laughs> I'm Hindu, but not like Narendra Modi hates Muslims Hindu, but I do think I'm better than Christians. <laughs> oh, now you're religious all of a sudden. <laughs> Listen, if you're offended by anything I've said, just trust that all these words were written by God, okay? <laughs> I'm merely an instrument. <laughs> I've been shitting on Christianity all across this country, and Christians have been really upset. Some Christian was like, I bet you won't make fun of Islam, why don't you make fun of Islam? Because I don't want to get Charlie Hebdo, okay? That's a fair reason. <laughs> I was shitting on Christianity in Indianapolis to the point where this priest who was in the crowd got up and left. This guy whose sole job it is to listen to confession, people say the worst shit ever, got up 
and said, every knee shall bow. And by some divine inspiration, I said, yeah, to suck Jesus' gay ass dick. <laughs> I'm going to hell. Psych, that place ain't real. <laughs> I almost converted to Christianity because of Christmas. <laughs> Christmas almost got me, but then my parents, they hatched a plan. When I was like nine years old, I wanted an autograph Michael Jordan basketball for Christmas, and they got me an autograph Anthony Hardaway basketball. <laughs> to ask for a Michael Jordan autograph basketball and get an Anthony Hardaway autograph basketball is like asking for an iPhone and getting an Anthony Hardaway autograph basketball. <laughs> I was so upset, but I was opening the box up, right? I was like, oh, yes, it's a basketball-shaped box. Like, ooh, here it is. I look, and I opened this shit up. I was like, Anthony Hardaway? I fucking hate Jesus. My parents like, yes, Jesus is the devil. <laughs> Hinduism has its flaws. The caste system, the worst set of rules that exist across any religious system. The caste system, if you're unaware, is a system that dictates what jobs people can basically have, allowing people's money and status in society. It was the inspiration for the Amazon corporate ladder, if you're unaware. <laughs> it's pronounced cost, but that's how they say it in England, and fuck that country entirely. So I'll just keep saying cast. Yeah, that's right. Any British people here? Shut the fuck up. Fuck England as a record label, a staff, and as a motherfucking crew. Uh -uh. When Prince Philip died, I jerked off. I did. I masturbated to the idea of coming in his mouth. Like, hey, how's that for assault tax, you colonial twat? <laughs> I'm sorry. Hinduism's great. It's great. It's a great religion if you're in the market. Great food, great parties, no molestation. <laughs> Unless you join Bikram Yoga, in which case, at this point, it's your fault, okay? <laughs> There's no conversion process either. You just gotta go to Union Square, put on an orange loincloth, and say, Hare Krishna, a few times. <laughs> <You'll be right. laughs> America is already a fairly Hindu place, as I think about it. The main stereotype I got growing up, kids would be like, oh, you guys worship cows, right? You guys worship cows. That's what American kids would say. I can't think of a group of people that worship cows more than Americans. <laughs> you just worship cows the same way you worship Jesus. You eat the motherfucker, okay? <laughs> yeah, I know all about communion. You're not gonna get away from it. You, you eat flesh, you drink blood, you almost drown a baby, yet you're against abortion. Okay, Christians, whatever you say. <laughs> there's this group of Hindus, there's this group of Hindus in New Jersey that built a $10 million temple, but instead of using labor from the United States, they imported lower caste labor, kept them on temple grounds, paid them nothing, and said, God wanted you to do it this way. That's the most American shit I ever heard, no? <laughs> I was introduced to Hinduism when I was five. My mom put a giant red dot on my forehead. I was like, go to school, it'll protect you from evil. <laughs> it did not. I'll just go to school and every kid named John, Paul, and Peter would be like, mm-hmm, you got a little red dot on your head, pew, pew. And I'd be like, shut the fuck up, you Ash Wednesday fuck. <laughs> Anger's one of these vices you're supposed to get rid of as a Hindu, but we also believe in reincarnation, so that's the next guy's problem. I don't give a shit. <laughs> and to conclude my point, I can't think of anything more American than putting a target on a kid's head and sending him to school. No, that's pretty fucking American. <laughs> Soft. Soft, soft ass crowd. <laughs> this is the last thing I'll say about Hinduism. It helped get me laid. Long before the Kama Sutra, I was going to this thing called Gerba. <laughs> the New Jersey Indians have identified themselves. <laughs> Gerba is this religious festival that would happen September and October to celebrate the Hindu holiday of Navratri Indians and Hindus would gather in a high school to dance around a statue of God for three to four hours to celebrate the triumph of good over evil. It'd also be where teenagers would go to celebrate the triumph of hormones over everything. 
we just dance and be all sweaty and talk to each other with samosa breath. And then, and then if it didn't work out, we end up at a Taco Bell drive through yelling, hey, substitute beans in that pizza, bro. <laughs> I grew up in a town called Parsippany, New Jersey. Parsippany is a town named after Larry Bearshield type Indians and now run by H1B ass Indians. <laughs> H-1Bs, if you're unaware, are the people that actually stole the jobs and let Mexicans take all the blame. I got a bunch of H-1B cousins like, yeah, keep blaming the Mexicans. We'll be right here earning this good white money. I got a lot of H-1B fans. I can sense some of you are here right now. Most of you are great, but some of these H-1Bs have lost their minds. Because I talk a lot of shit about Narendra Modi on the internet. And all these H1Bs are like, how dare you say something about Narendra Modi? You don't know anything about India? I'm like, relax, mom. <laughs> Narendra Modi lifted India out of poverty. Don't you say anything about Narendra Modi? A word? He opened up more call centers so you could scam white people out of money? Go, oh, that's dope. <laughs> I got a call from a scammer the other day. This India dude called me. Hi, can I talk to Nimesh Patel? This is Jeff. No, it ain't, bro. <laughs> no one named Jeff has ever pronounced Nimesh Patel correctly, okay? <laughs> I got a plan. You do the back end work, I'll do the voice. We'll clean up in this motherfucker. Now, what's your social security number? <laughs> Parsippany was so Indian that my elementary school had a translator. Another eight year old Indian kid that would translate that would translate for any Indian kid that couldn't speak English. And I transferred from one side of Parsippany to the other side of Parsippany in first grade, right around Christmas time. And I was so upset, I decided I would pretend to not speak any English. I was sitting there crying at my desk, and they send this little eight-year-old kid over. He's like, hey, buddy, I'll, I'll translate for you, man. No need to cry. I got you, bro. I was like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I speak English. I'm just trying to ride this shit out till break. If you snitch, I swear to God, I'll put your head between your ears. You understand me? So then he started crying. <laughs> that night I went home and my sister and I stayed up super late watching Home Alone and setting traps for my dad. <laughs> that the next morning I had forgotten my ruse, that I didn't speak any English. And the teacher is reading something. She's like, Sally holds a apple. I was like, I believe it's an apple. And she goes, you speak English? It's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> Thank you, White Santa. <laughs> Parsippany, by the time I was in high school, had so many Indians that I was Patel number eight. <laughs> My senior class had 22 Patels, and I would always get this question, why are there so many Patels? Why are there so many Patels? Because we killed all the Smiths, that's why. <laughs> it's over for you fucks. And when you grow up surrounded by that many of your own people, you learn this value called resilience. Because you know people always have your back. You could not be racist towards Indian kids in Parsippany. I remember one time some kid was like, you guys did 9-11. I was like, yeah, we did 9-11 and we'll do it again too. <laughs> I got 19 cousins right here. I'm sure one of us knows how to fly. It's all trigonometry, bro. We'll figure that shit out. You want to go? Let's go. <laughs> My sister is one of the most resilient people I know. Because she went through this, oh, Indian names are so weird. Indian names are so exotic. They're so weird. What does your name mean? Her name is Noka. It means boat. <laughs> Not like hand-carved canoe or, or beautiful sailing vessel. Just regular-ass boat. <laughs> and she could have gone her whole life pissed off, annoyed at her name. But instead, she flipped it. This year for Halloween, she went as little yachty. You understand? Resilience. <laughs> S.S. Resilience. <laughs> I grew up so Indian, we go to Indian-only parties. Every Friday and Saturday night, every Indian teenager in the Trice area, after Gerba, would descend upon Club Platinum in New Brunswick, New Jersey. <laughs> Club Platinum, if you don't know, was the epicenter of some of the greatest Indian parties of all time. But yo, you've never seen so many Honda Accords and Toyota Camrys. <laughs> Me and my five cousins would roll six deep in a Toyota Camry wearing different color express shirts, <laughs> looking like cell phone kiosk operators, <laughs> depth gel out the ass, stiff as fuck. 
and we go to platinum and we sniff girls' hair. That's what we did. That was our move. We called ourselves the Cuomos, you know? <laughs> and we would pregame in the parking lot of a Dunkin' Donuts. If you don't understand, every Dunkin' Donuts in the Northeast is owned and operated by Indian people. We basically be pregaming like our cousin's driveway. <laughs> and our pregame would be one bottle of Bacardi, one bottle of Coca-Cola, and one bottle of Curve Cologne. <laughs> Curve, if you don't know, is a cologne. When you put it on, women go around you. <laughs> one night, we got so fucked up that we had to sleep in the car. The next morning, there's six Indians in neon shirts, hungover, in a Toyota Camry in the parking lot of a Dunkin' Donuts. And then there's a knock on the window, and it's an Indian cop. And I look up, and my first thought is an Indian cop. <laughs> His parents must be mad disappointed. <laughs> Yeah, I'll roll down the window and say, what are you boys doing here? Luckily, I was quick enough to just be like, waiting to start our shift, officer. <laughs> you want a French vanilla? I got you. <laughs> I started drinking my senior year. I had my first sip of alcohol when I was 13. And thank God that Johnny Walker Black is disgusting to a 13-year-old Indian kid. Because if it was something delicious like mango white claw, pff, I definitely would have drank all throughout high school. I would have ended up at Rutgers University. <laughs> and then I'd definitely be a doctor, right? That's, of course, that's the path. Thank you, Johnny Walker Black, for saving my life. Don't get me wrong, I was still pre-med, obviously. I was pre-med finance at NYU. I could have been most of you people. But I dropped pre-med my junior year because I got a C in organic chemistry. I got a C in organic chemistry because I failed the lab. I failed the lab because we were making some compound in this lab, and I accidentally made some cocaine-adjacent compound. <laughs> and then I inhaled this compound to the point where my heart started beating out of my chest. And the lab tech was like, uh, you failed the lab, and uh, if this keeps up, you got to go to the hospital. <laughs> and that night I went home, and I realized I didn't want to be a doctor. And since I couldn't do cocaine, I couldn't do finance either, right? And <laughs> now here I am. <laughs> what a time. Thank God I get to spread laughter. Because apparently this country no longer believes that medicine is the best medicine. We'll try anything else, but medicine? No, 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 no. <laughs> Science is for retards. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? There's people that don't believe in science in this country, and they're not even black. <laughs> black people have a legit historical gripe against science. The rest of us are eating ketchup, ignoring the fact that ketchup is science. You realize that? Ketchup is science. It's tomatoes and high fructose corn syrup. That's science. I only bring that up because I think there's a strong correlation between people that don't believe in science and also consume a lot of ketchup. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, it's okay. <laughs> but I don't disagree. I don't trust medicine either. Because healthcare is a criminal enterprise. <laughs> healthcare is a criminal enterprise. <laughs> it is. I wasn't concerned about getting COVID and dying. When it's your time to go, you go. I was concerned about getting COVID, being in a hospital for two weeks, and then coming out with a bill for $2 million. That's what I was terrified <laughs> of. That happened to multiple people in this country. The greatest country in the world, multiple people got $2 million bills for having coronavirus. If I was in a coma for two weeks and I came out with a bill for $2 million, I would laugh myself back into the coma. <laughs> yeah, Two million dollars, yeah, put the shit on China's tab. I pay for that shit. <laughs> Call up Xi Jinping, tell him Nemesh Patel owes him two million. Two million dollars? Two million dollars. Because healthcare is a criminal enterprise. Healthcare has this virus known as capitalism. That eye roll you just heard is all my finance friends being like, oh, another communist, here we go. 
goddamn right I'm communist. I love China. You understand? <laughs> and this virus has obviously infected hospital companies, billing companies, pharmaceutical companies. They're fucked. But now this virus has gone on to doctors. And I know this firsthand because I have 16 first cousins. <laughs> Five of them are doctors. And all we do is argue about healthcare prices in America. Why don't you do something about healthcare prices? And all my doctor cousins say the same thing. Our hands are tied, okay? Our hands are tied. It's a system that's broken, which is the dorkiest way of saying, don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> Doctors don't do shit because their hands are tied with money. That's what the problem is. <laughs> Listen, we care about people. We don't do it for the money. And then they drive off into Tesla. It's like, wait, what, bro, what? <laughs> Mother Teresa never had no Model 3. <laughs> they don't do anything. They won't even change the price of Band-Aids. You know how much a 15-cent Band-Aid is in a New York City hospital? A 15-cent Band-Aid? $7. Because apparently the hospital is also the mini bar at the Ritz-Carlton. $7? <laughs> seven, seven, seven dollars. It's never some fly Band-Aid. Doesn't have Elmo on it. <laughs> it's not an off-white Band-Aid that says Band-Aid. It's just a regular... <laughs> A regular Band-Aid. You know how much a knee costs in this country? $25,000. You know how much a Toyota Camry costs? $22,000. And I've never known a knee to get 192,000 miles. You can't get a discount on a knee. You can't hobble into the doctor's office like, hey, say, bro, anything you do for the, come on, man, come on, man, come on, man, please, please, come on, man. The doctor would be like, well, you could suck my dick, but the irony would be too profound. You getting on two knees to get one new one? <laughs> get the fuck out of my office. See, the problem is that we treat doctors like saints in this country. But really, to me, they're like prostitutes. They provide a necessary service. You can identify them by their clothing. And if you can't pay, they have you by the balls. But at least prostitutes have the decency to tell you how much they're going to charge. With a doctor, you just get fucked. <laughs> Go ask any doctor, hey, hey, doc, uh, how much is this procedure about to provide? I don't know. You got to talk to my pimp, Blue Cross Blue Shield. I got nothing to do with that, man. <laughs> and doctors get real upset when I talk all this shit. Oh, you're just jealous. You weren't smart enough to become a physician. <laughs> Listen, anyone can go to the Caribbean, OK? It's not that difficult. <laughs> It ain't easy, but it ain't hard. <laughs> You're just jealous. <laughs> Doctors all justify their high salaries by saying, uh, we get paid so much because med school is so expensive, OK? And I understand that. OK. Hear me out. Here's a solution I proposed. How about we eliminate all medical school debt? <laughs> we eliminate all medical school debt, and then we pay doctors minimum wage. <laughs> Don't worry, there'll be tips. <laughs> Cash tips. Thanks for keeping the lube warm, Doc. <laughs> Any doctors here? Yeah. Clap if you're a doctor. You're a doctor? Where are the other doctors at? Doctors, doctors. OK, staff, please make note of where the doctors are. And by the way, if you're afraid of saying you're a doctor, just pretend I'm a pharmaceutical sales rep. OK, we got, we got doctors here, we got a doctor here. Doctor here, I know I've been harsh. As a special treat on your way out, you'd be charged $400 for no fucking reason. <laughs> Surprise medical bill, bitch! That's what happens. Facility fee for stepping into this motherfucker. <laughs> I don't fully blame doctors. Yeah, obviously, insurance companies and all that shit, they deserve most of the blame. Doctors are our last line of defense. But I also think Americans do not deserve health care. We need it. Deserve is the wrong word. We don't care about our health. How do you deserve health care if you don't care about your health? I know I don't deserve health care. I recently discovered exactly how much weed someone needs to smoke to have an asthma attack. <laughs> and I had an asthma attack. <laughs> I went to a Travis Scott concert, back when it was still OK to do, OK? You fuck with Travis Scott, John? Hell yeah. Travis Scott is one of my favorite artists. I was listening to him on the way here, and I heard a lyric that was so funny, I almost fell off my city bike. <laughs> and he goes, 
eating that punane got my bangs wet. We gonna have to change for the banquet. Dripping. <laughs> you understand the lyric? He's so deep in the pussy, he's car washing with his bangs, you see? <laughs> and now the pussy juice has gotten on the outfit he was gonna wear to the banquet he was attending, but it's been ruined. <laughs> what a poet. <laughs> I went to a Travis Scott concert and I smoked four blunts in an hour. And then, that song, Stop Trying to Be God, came on. I was like, you're right, Travis. I have to go to the hospital. <laughs> and I called an Uber to the hospital, because they don't let ambulances in at Travis Scott concerts. And... <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I called an Uber to the hospital, because an ambulance is $600, and I'm not going to die a sucker, right? <laughs> Now I get to the hospital, NYU Langone in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and now I have asthma, so I know exactly what I need. Ah, doctor, I'm having an asthma attack. You're having an asthma attack. I need albuterol nebulizer. You need albuterol nebulizer. Is this self-checkout? What's going on, bro? <laughs> Give me my fucking medicine. And he's like, you'll be fine, and he scuttles away in his Ferragamo loafers. <laughs> and then he sends in a nurse was a menu of all the other shit I could be getting since I've stopped in at Casa de NYU. <laughs> Blood work, EKG, x-ray. Now they're not trying to treat me for a heart attack. What they're doing is running up the insurance tab because insurance will just pay whatever a hospital says. Luckily, I said the magic words. I said, I don't have coverage. <laughs> she threw an inhaler at me. She was like, get out, you wheezy broke bitch. <laughs> I'm in and out in an hour and a half. Get home. Two weeks later, get the bill. $6,000. I had another asthma attack. Six, $6,000 $6, for an hour and a half, and I didn't come once? Luckily, I was raised by Indian people who taught me that the price is never the price until you talk about the price. <laughs> That's where we're at in America. You, you gotta haggle for your life these days. I called the hospital. I said, listen, I'm not gonna give you $6,000. They said, why not? I said, well, for one, you already gave me the medicine. <laughs> Two, I don't have $6,000. Now I have $6,000, but I also know a little bit about the healthcare system. I know that you get sick at the beginning of the year like I did. Every hospital has this giant pool of money they have to give away for free care in order to stay nonprofit. Sidebar, if you get corona in December, just hold on, okay? <laughs> oh, hold on. But know this. I know this as I'm talking to this lady. I was like, look, I don't have $6,000. I'm not going to give you $6,000. I don't have $6,000. They literally said, how much do you have? <laughs> Did I call the mob? Who the fuck? <laughs> I got nothing. You can break my knees if you want. I'm not giving you $6,000. All right, Ms. Patel, no need to get irate. Listen, you don't owe us anything. But please understand that if you truly can't pay, you don't owe us anything. But if you can pay and you're not paying, you might be taking $6,000 out of the pocket of someone who truly can't pay. I was like, don't hate the player, hit the game. Click. <laughs> I was so glad I finessed NYU out of $6,000, but then I remembered I went to NYU and they're still up about $200,000. <laughs> Life's about small victories. <laughs> After almost dying, you kind of reevaluate your life. You know, I've been trying to be a better person, I'm trying to work out a lot more, only because I think I'm going to have to fight Kumail Nanjiani at some point. <laughs> I'm training for that day. Kumail, if you don't know, is a fantastic comedian. He's Pakistani, and he's jacked. If every Pakistani was as big as Kumail is, they would have never caught Bin Laden. <laughs> I'm pitching a movie to Kumail right now. We want to remake the movie Nustic. It's about 1947 India, when partition happened, when the Brits left India, they divided the subcontinent into Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India and they divided it up against really crooked borders, I'm guessing using the outlines of their teeth. And, <laughs> and when they left, 
this, this partition caused the exodus of millions of people and the death of like two million people. In the movie, the Pakistanis and the Indians hate each other. But in my version with Kumail, we team up and rewrite history in glorious bastard style. <laughs> we go to England, right? And then we seduce Winston Churchill's wife. <laughs> and then we find Winston Churchill, grab him by his fat ass cheeks, and say for the first time in history, that's why we fucked your bitch, you fat motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be a better person. <laughs> I am, I really am. I am trying to be a better person. I'm trying to identify moments when I'm mad and turn them into moments of laughter. This came to a full head a little while ago when there was a hurricane in New York. Hurricane Ida hit New York and I had to go do a show. And I called an SUV to come pick me up. As I'm stepping into this SUV, I missed the curb. So instead of stepping into this SUV, I step into six inches of New York City rainwater. So now I got AIDS foot, right? Yeah. That's a clinical term. Now, <laughs> I get into the SUV, and I'm pissed off, right? I can't go back upstairs. I'm already late. So I take my boot off. I pour all this water out, take my sock off, slam it on the seat, take this dude's hand sanitizer, squeeze it into my hands, rub it all between my toes. And now my hand's sticky. My foot is sticky. I'm pissed off. I take this sock. I wring it dry, and I hang it in the... SUV's AC vent, you know? And I'm checking if the driver's looking or not. I'm fucking pissed off. I'm hanging and trying to dry this sock. And I catch myself in the rear view mirror. I'm like, oh shit, I am Mr. Bean. Just. <laughs> <laughs> I never laughed harder in my life. I'm trying to be the person I am on Molly at all times. You know what I mean? <laughs> Generous, sexually fluid, all those things. You ever done Molly before? How old are you? 28. 28, yeah, you don't deserve it yet. <laughs> All these teens and 20-year-olds doing drugs, they don't deserve them. I just started doing drugs in my 30s. In my teens and 20s, I was trying to figure out who I am as a person, who I am as a man. In my 30s, I realized I ain't shit. I'm going to do all the drugs there are. <laughs> you got to go through that journey before you start doing drugs. You never done Molly before? The way it works is it releases all the serotonin in your brain for three to four hours. So you're the happiest you've ever been. And then for the next two to four days, you want to commit suicide. <laughs> but for those three to four hours, you feel like a 21-year-old white woman. It's incredible. <laughs> the scientific term is MDMA. It stands for, mm, damn, Molly's amazing. It's incredible. <laughs> the reason I love Molly so much is that it's a very communal drug. It brings people together. It's all love when you're on Molly. If we were dropping Molly instead of bombs, there'd be no problems in the world. <laughs> the last time I did Molly, I went to this warehouse party in Brooklyn. That's where they have them. They used to kill people there, and now 30-year-olds go find themselves. <laughs> and at this warehouse party, they're playing EDM music, electronic dance music. But on top of it, they had overlaid Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but it's the freest I've ever felt. <laughs> Now, I'm, I'm peeking on Molly as Martin Luther King Jr. is dropping some of the hottest lines in human history. And I look around, and I see black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, <laughs> Protestants and Catholics, all holding hands and singing the words that Negro spiritual levels by Avicii. <laughs> free at last, free at last. Thank God, oh, Molly, free at last. <laughs> That joke is for people who know Martin Luther King Jr. and also Levels by Avicii. It's a, it's a weird Venn diagram. <laughs> I considered stopping doing Molly because I was talking to this neurologist and he was telling me that once all the serotonin in your brain is depleted, your receptors take in dopamine and that dopamine breaks down into peroxide, destroying your serotonin receptors, effectively ending your ability to experience happiness in the near future. But as he's telling me this, I kind of zoned out. And, <laughs> and when I came back into the conversation, he was talking about how all lives matter. I was like, oh, I can't trust this dude at all, man. <laughs> I'm gonna just keep dancing. <laughs> but I, I weaned myself off of Molly, because now I do shrooms. <laughs> shrooms are so much better. They're all natural. They're very cathartic. The first time I did shrooms, I cried for 30 minutes. I was like, will me and my dad ever be best friends? The second time I did shrooms, I cried for 30 minutes. I was a piece of shit to my mom. And the third time I did shrooms, like, oh, 
I got to dose my parents, right? <laughs> I'm gonna tell my mom it's Ayurvedic medicine. Here you go. <laughs> my parents are here, by the way. Give it up for them. They're in the back. <laughs> it's gonna be a very difficult conversation later. Because they knew about the drug use, but they did not know about the asthma attack. <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> my parents are my biggest fans. They watch everything I do. My dad saw me smoking weed on a YouTube live stream. And my dad called me almost immediately. Nimesh, what are you smoking? I said, it's, it's weed, Dad. He said, you need to quit. I said, okay, I'll quit smoking weed if you quit smoking cigarettes. He said the most dad shit ever. Said, I'm not gonna argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dad, we just had the argument. You lost, it's fine, take the L, bro. <laughs> he said, I'll get you back. Then he hung up, and a few moments later, I started seeing all the dislikes on my YouTube videos go up by one. <laughs> it's like, dad, what are you doing? You're fucking with the algorithm, bro, stop. <laughs> and then 10 minutes later, I got a call from my mom, Nimesh. What are you smoking? And she's mad religious, so I was like, Hindu Kush? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said, don't be smart. Is that weed you need to stop? It's illegal. I said, illegal? So I was not paying taxes on that all-cash liquor store we got going on. But <laughs> I won't tell if you don't. Without missing a beat, she says, Nimesh, the store's in your name. You don't pay taxes. <laughs> Snitching on myself. <laughs> She says, Nimesh, you need to stop. You have asthma. I said, Mom, weed is actually a bronchodilator. She goes, oh, now you want to be a doctor. Hmm? Oh, that's cute. <laughs> Nimesh, point blank, I don't want you to die. I said, Mom, it ain't living if you ain't dying, bro. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. That's my time. Thank you.